Our scripture reading for today is John 15, just verses 1 through 8 as we continue to get through this gospel message uh, week by week and verse by verse. Let's read together. Well, I'll read it. <laughs> I am the vine, says Jesus, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. This is the word of the Lord. And let us pray. Lord, I want this message to bear much fruit, but it can't if you're not in it. So all week long I have been praying that you would guide me to present and prepare what will most bless me and my friends here we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. But I want to start by talking about faith. Do you know that there were only two times it is said that Jesus was ever amazed by anything in the Gospels? One is recorded in both the Gospel of Matthew chapter 8 and Luke chapter 7. That's the story of the centurion who had such faith that when Jesus offered to go to his house to heal his servant, the soldier said, Oh, you don't have to do that. I know that if you just give the command, my servant will be healed. Our Bible says, When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Truly, I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. The other time the Bible says that Jesus was amazed is recorded in Mark chapter 6, 4 through 6, when he visited his own hometown. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do many miracles there, except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. How strong is your faith? Do you know that your faith can grow? Jesus' disciples even requested of him, Lord, increase our faith. They wanted their faith to grow, and they knew they couldn't do it. It was up to the Lord to do it for them, in them. In the Bible, the thing that God compliments more often than anything else is strong faith. And Hebrews 11 is the hall of fame for faith. They were not perfect. But they were all there because God was honored by their faith in him. Their lives showed it. For example, when Abram left his family and home to go where God would lead him, he had no idea where he would end up. But he had faith in God that he would lead him and keep his promises. In a lot of church circles today and denominational meetings when pastors are talking to each other and asking about, how's your church going? Guess what they talk about? I bet you know. It's like, how many people are attending? Is your church growing? How's the budget being met? What programs or buildings are you working on? You know what's a rare topic, strangely enough? How is the faith of your congregation? How strong is their faith? But that's what the Bible focuses on. When Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he began with, Ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. 
Similarly to the Colossians, he said, We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all of God's people. Our faith is really important to God. But how does God increase our faith? Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word about Christ. Well, that message is in our Bibles. If you read it, that's just like hearing it, especially if you read out loud. And that, my friends, is how we abide with Christ as he's talking about in today's text. Jesus says, I am the true vine. This means that Jesus is the root and source of all true life. There is no other place to find life. If you want to be alive, you must be in Jesus. And then Jesus says, my father is the gardener. You know all about gardening. It means that God has control over how much we grow and whether or not we grow. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. He wants us to be fruitful. So sometimes he has to prune us back, cut things out of our lives that are hindering growth. You know, that represents pain and difficulties. The discipline and training that comes from the loving Father. God's Word teaches us that. And so if we stay in the Word and believe what it says, we can give thanks for pruning and pain, even if it is painful. Its purpose is not to cut us off, but to make us bear fruit. We have to let God do His work. We're not really doing anything except clinging to Jesus by faith. And growth happens when we are plugged into that life. And faith grows too. Next, Jesus reassures his disciples, you're already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. The word clean there refers to having already been pruned. When the pruner works in the garden and he's finished pruning a branch, he says it's clean. And he expects it to bear fruit. And Jesus just said that his disciples were clean because of the word God had spoken to them. The Word of God is what God uses to cleanse us. Jesus is the Word par excellence. But we stay in touch with Jesus through the written Word of the Bible and our quiet times in prayer with Him. And that is what we must do. Jesus commanded it. Remain in me as I also remain in you. That's an order. Cling to Jesus. There is no other hope in life. So this is a very practical sermon. Abide in Christ through prayer and the reading of his word. No one can live without Jesus. All those people walking around who say they don't believe in Jesus or don't need him or not really alive. Well, they think they are. But we know they're dead in their sin because that's what the Bible says is true about unbelievers. And then Jesus gives us a simple fact of life. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Have you ever seen what happens to a branch of a tree that's removed from the trunk? The leaves might stay green for a while, but it isn't growing anymore. No fruit will develop there. No matter how alive it looks when you first cut it off, it's dead. So how do we stay alive? All we have to do is cling to Jesus. But how do we cling to Jesus? How do we abide in him? By faith in his work and by fellowship in his spirit. And that is all facilitated by our time in God's word and our time with God in prayer. So Jesus sort of repeats himself. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Don't even try to do anything without depending on Jesus to bring life to it. But if you do cling to Jesus, you will bear much fruit. It's kind of an automatic thing. So 
Fruit is not the result of your efforts to do good works. Fruit is the evidence of how tightly you're clinging to Jesus. Are you bearing fruit? How do you evaluate that? Well, here's a couple of things about that. What about the discipline of your regular, daily, quiet time with God? So many Christians fall short in this area. The devil loves to keep us busy doing good things while we assume we are abiding in Christ just because we say we are a believer. But if you're not clinging to Jesus, intentionally spending time with him, how can your busyness be fruitful? Jesus says it can't. Are you walking in the Spirit with Jesus? Do you love Him? Is His character rubbing off on you so you exhibit in your life and in your interactions with other people more and more of the fruit of the Spirit as listed in Galatians 5.23? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Does your life and attitude look like that kind of person. And what about the fruit of evangelism? Perhaps the toughest one of all. Do you excuse yourself from sharing the gospel because you're not very good at it? Or do you pray for opportunities to share the gospel, to share the love of God and teach about Jesus? Have you led many souls to faith in Jesus or at least talk to them to try? Are you wanting to or are you afraid to? If you're disappointed about any of that, maybe it's just because you're not spending enough time in prayer and God's Word. Because Jesus' promise is not that if you try hard enough, you will bear much fruit. What he said was, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. Sounds to me like you can start out as a believer, like the seed planted in the shallow soil or the rocky soil, but then lose touch with Jesus because of scorching heat or weeds in the way. Do you feel like you're withering away fruitlessly? Well, it's not too late. Jesus says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Cling to Jesus. Get back into the Word. Spend time in prayer. One title of a book says, You're Too Busy Not to Pray. It takes a lot of faith to ask whatever you wish. But it's not about faith in faith or your ability to believe something that seems impossible. It's all about faith in Jesus. Faith is not about believing that God will do what I want Him to do. Faith is about believing that Jesus is all he says he is. That Jesus loves you as much as he says he does. And that you can trust him to take the best care of you as long as you cling to him. Faith is about believing that it is really worth our while to spend time with Jesus every day. Then he will be free to work through us and thus we will bear much fruit. So back to that amazing faith of the centurion. He believed that Jesus was a man of authority so that whatever Jesus commanded would be done. It is not that the centurion's faith persuaded Jesus to heal his servant. It is that when the centurion saw that Jesus was willing to heal the servant, Then the centurion demonstrated his faith in Jesus by adding, Oh, but you don't have to even come to my house. Just say the word, and I know it will be done, because I know you have that kind of power. That's not just great faith in and of itself. That's great faith in who Jesus says he is. And for the same reason, in his own hometown, Jesus could not do many miracles, not because he doesn't have the power, but because the people didn't have faith in Jesus as a man from God bearing divine authority. It is not that Jesus wasn't willing to heal. They just didn't believe he could. So the key is to have faith in Jesus, 
and to cling to him as the divine person who loves you most and wants what is best for you. Faith is not about having faith in faith, as if faith itself has any power. Jesus has all the power. Now there is an error about faith that's quite common in our culture, so I feel I must mention it here. Faith healers so easily make the mistake of assuming that Jesus is always willing to heal. But all you have to do is look at Paul the Apostle, who prayed to be healed of that thorn in his flesh that tormented him and made his ministry more difficult. Jesus did not take away that thorn. He didn't heal Paul that way, so there's proof that Jesus isn't always willing to heal the way we want him to. But maybe we could say that he healed Paul's desire for that healing when he told him, my grace is sufficient for you. This reminded Paul to just cling to Jesus the Savior and trust in him with faith in Jesus that he would do the right thing, the best thing, but not necessarily the thing first asked for. And I've known plenty of people whose testimony about God's goodness is more powerful because they love him for who he is, even if he doesn't or didn't heal their bodies. God does have power to heal. So it's never wrong to ask for a miracle. It's only wrong to demand it or throw a temper tantrum if he doesn't heal or give up on faith in him if he doesn't heal or insist that if God doesn't heal, then he's not God. But faith healers who operate in this error would never say that God is not God. So they have to place the blame for any lack of healing back on the person and claim that if you're not healed, it's because you don't have enough faith. Well, I conclude that it's wrong to argue that a sick person... That, I'm sorry, that it's wrong to argue that if a sick person had more faith, they could be healed. I notice that the faith healers usually talk about faith in the idea that Jesus can heal. They don't talk as much about just having faith in Jesus, the Savior, no matter what happens. But when we have faith in Jesus, and we truly love him for who he is, then we always have hope and joy, even if we never get a physical healing in this life. We need the healer way more than we need the healing. And the spiritual healing that we receive when he enters into our hearts is good enough to bear up under any lack of physical healing. But that doesn't mean don't ask for miracles. That doesn't mean don't ask for physical healing because Jesus can do that for us too. Not that he has to, but that he may. You know what? None of us really have enough faith. Not in this life. It only takes faith like the grain of a mustard seed to be saved, but faith can grow. And Jesus wants our faith in him to grow. Faith grows as we cling to Jesus. And as faith grows, then loving Jesus no matter what becomes more and more the fact of the life we live. That's why Jesus told us to abide in him the way a branch clings to the vine. Growth comes from Jesus. Life comes from Jesus. Fruit comes from Jesus. It comes through us and hangs on our branch, but Jesus gets all the credit for making it happen. So now, as we prepare to receive communion today, I like the fact that bread is made of grains of wheat, which is the fruit of a species of grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Jesus is the word of the God, the bread of life. He gave his life for us. He didn't keep it for himself. And the cup is filled with the fruit of the vine. Jesus is the vine, and the cup is the representation of his blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. The fruit of Jesus' life is our cleansing and nourishment in the Spirit. And you know what? Similarly, as our lives also bear fruit in Christ, the fruit we bear is not for ourselves either, but for the blessing of others. The fruit of the Spirit is love. 
so we love one another. It is joy, so we rejoice in fellowship with each other. It is peace, so we live in peace with each other. It is patience, so we bear with each other because we're not perfect yet. It is kindness, so we're kind to one another, even in the midst of conflict. It is gentleness, so we treat each other gently. It is self-control, so we keep a tight rein on our tongues, for instance, so that we don't hurt one another. But that fruit is born in us as we cling to Jesus, as we draw life from Jesus, abiding in him as a branch clings to a vine. Then the good fruit is an inevitable result. So is the growth of our faith in him. So come, let us keep the feast. But I want to give a prayer of thanksgiving first. Lord, we thank you for being so perfect and for offering the fruit of your life for our salvation and life and for making fruit grow in us as we cling to you. Thank you for all these blessings that we get to share with the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen.